Uh, the reason the Institute of Medicine has had a second look at this issue um, uh, is because a lot of evidence has accumulated since the last time they, they made recommendations, which was in 2005. Uh, basically, the old recommendations have been based on blood pressure. Uh, if you have a high blood pressure and you have a high salt intake and you reduce your salt intake, it will lower your blood pressure and that seems to be a good thing. But it turns out that if you have normal blood pressure or you have average sodium intakes, lowering your salt intake doesn't produce any benefit. There's always been some evidence to that effect, but the evidence for blood pressure was so strong that it kind of dominated the agenda of people who sat around and tried to decide what the recommendations ought to be. But recently, and particularly in the last seven, eight years, a lot of evidence has been produced which shows that if you lower salt intake in people who already have low blood pressure or who already have reasonably low salt intakes, in fact, instead of getting better, you have more heart attacks, more heart failure, and more cardiac deaths. So it was not an improvement. And uh, the change in evidence warranted a change in recommendations. I, that's the way science advances. We tell you what we know today, and, and uh, we try to do the best we can with the evidence we have available. The evidence that the experts were going on was based on what happens to people who have high blood pressure and, and, and have high salt intakes. And they assumed, not unreasonably, I'm not going to criticize them for this, they assumed that if you got better from a high salt intake, you would get better even more by lowering your salt intake when you were down at normal or even low. Uh, it's, it's the old idea, if a little bit's good, more is better. Well, we know that that's not always true, and it turns out it, that it wasn't true in this case. So they were basing their case on a blood pressure change, not on health outcomes. The health outcomes are expensive to determine, they're big studies, they're hard to do, and it just took a long time to get those data, which are really what's important. Blood pressure wouldn't matter if it didn't have an effect on your cardiac health. When they looked at the data again last fall, late last fall, the evidence became so overwhelming that they decided we've got to tell people, look, the average salt intake of Americans is okay. You won't get any benefit by trying to reduce it further. No point in concentrating on that. It doesn't help. It's just that simple. Why do we need sodium? Well, we need it because all the higher animals trace their origin back to the sea. We lived in the sea, and the sea is salty. And our body fluids mimic what was in the sea. We have to have sodium in those body fluids. If we don't, then the volume of our body fluids shrink because the body tries to keep the concentration normal. But if the volume shrinks, then you don't have enough blood to pump. You don't have enough blood to get to the critical tissues, your kidney, your brain, etc. So sodium is absolutely necessary for maintaining blood and extracellular fluid volume. The extracellular fluid is the fluid that bathes all the cells and tissues in our body. The blood is a part of the extracellular fluid. Sodium is the, is the principal cation, the principal metal ion uh, in those body fluids. So it's absolutely vital. Too much sodium is bad for you uh, if you happen to be sodium sensitive because it raises your blood pressure. And a raise in blood pressure can lead to an increased risk of heart attack and stroke and, and other cardiac problems. That much is true. It's always been true. Uh, I, and it's why we had this campaign against salt, because we assumed that it would be true at all salt intake levels and all blood pressure levels, which we've now found isn't the case. If we don't have enough sodium, on the other hand, we can't maintain blood volume. And one of the easiest examples of that is a rare condition called Addison's disease. It's, it's a deficiency of the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands produce one of the hormones that helps regulate blood pressure, and they respond to the salt in your diet. Or they respond basically to the volume of, of, of fluid in your body. They can sense that. Uh, and if, if you don't have an adequate salt intake and you have adrenal insufficiency or Addison's disease, then you have low blood pressure and you stand up and you fall over. You just can't maintain blood pressure. 
because you've lost one of the mechanisms for doing that. Now, you can treat people with Addison's disease by high salt intake, so you substitute in diet what their own body controls would have done for them. Uh, it's not as good. Uh, we, we can't do it as well as the body does, but it's better than nothing. So having too little salt is bad for you. Having too much salt is bad for you. Uh, our society is kind of of two minds with, it, with respect to nutrition. The general public thinks nutrition is important, and the supplement manufacturers make a lot of money off of marketing their products because people, in fact, want to do what they can to ensure good nutrition. But for a strange reason that um, I can't completely understand, the field of medicine tends to look with skepticism on nutrition. And their prime focus on nutrition is nutrition is harm. And if you think of the usual suspects, what would you think of? You'd think of cholesterol, saturated fat, and salt. Those are the big three uh, that you're always warned that you have to watch out for and not get too much of. And there's been a big influence of that on our regulatory process. For instance, if you look at the food label on any processed or manufactured food that you buy in the grocery store, on the, on the top of that food uh, contents label, there will be listing of the content of cholesterol and saturated fat and sodium. They're all up there. By law, they have to be. They're warning the consumer about not getting too much of these things. These are nutrients to be minimized or watched out for or concerned about. Uh, actually, nutrition is about benefit. It's not about harm. Uh, it's not only something that tastes good, it's something that helps us be healthy, it's something we use uh, to share with other people, it's a, it, I mean, it's a part of our social culture, basically, food, good food. A and we ought to be focusing on the benefit rather than the harm. I can tell you a brief story. Uh, in 1918, which was just at the end of World War I, my father was nearly 30 years old then, so this is not back in the Dark Ages. Back in 1918, the father of modern nutritional chemistry, a man named E.V. McCollum, a Kansas native who had done the hard work to discover a couple of the vitamins, vitamin A and vitamin B1, as a matter of fact, was asked to speak before a combined panel, of, a standing panel of the American Medical Association on pharmacotherapeutics and one other group, I forget the exact title. And he pointed out that if you fed people diets that lack these things, they'd get sick. And they literally laughed him off the stage. They did so because they, they were convinced that if you took in enough food to allow you to do your daily work, you were by definition adequately nourished. So what you ate didn't matter, it was how much you ate. Oh, in, this, in the ensuing 10 years or so, a whole host of deficiency diseases were elucidated. Pellagra, scurvy, beriberi, rickets, all, all those things. And public health steps were taken. For instance, the states mandated fortification of uh, white flour with uh, iron and B vitamins. And the feds followed a few years later. And that led to the eradication of a lot of these diseases. Pellagra was was epidemic in the United States in the 1930s and it caused lots of deaths and, and huge disability. But we don't think of it anymore because it's been effectively eradicated. If you eat bread, you get what you need in order to... So medicine forgot about deficiency disease and it reverted back to, to, to its old model, which was that all human disease was caused by external agencies. There were toxins or there were microbes. Those were the two principal external agencies. And once again, the idea of that, that not eating something could make you sick was deemed to be foreign or strange or crazy. Uh, and, and there's a certain amount of skepticism about that still today in medicine. And one of the consequences of that is that the, the supplement industry has moved into that field with some claims that are outlandish and couldn't possibly be supported. And so that just reinforces medicine's prejudice against nutrition because there's a lot of nutrition quackery out there. Uh, it doesn't have to be. 
And, and people trust their doctors for nutrition advice, which is probably a mistake because the doctors don't get much education in nutrition, unfortunately. The important thing is that nutrition is important and the public does understand it. Nut nutrition is about what's good for you. It's not so much about what's harmful for you.